I want to open us in prayer. Father, I am so grateful for the truth of your word. I thank you for this beautiful book, The Song of Songs, and I thank you for the privilege of being able to go through it with these women that are here in this room, from the youngest all the way up to the oldest, and for all the women who I know are live streaming, and whether they belong to this church and just can't be here uh, today, or whether they will watch it later, and I thank you for women too, other women in other states and other places who will follow along with us, and I pray you continue to use it in each of our lives as I know you are using it in my life, and I am so thankful. Father, I pray you bless our time together, that you would, um, that you would just be here as you, we know you already are. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this is chapter one of the Song of Songs, and I titled it Young Love. Uh, I didn't really know what else to title it, but here we are, beginning a verse-by-verse verse, uh, look at the Song of Songs. And, you know, I introduced the book to you last time, and what an introduction it was. And I want to review that for a second before we delve into the first verse of this chapter, because we learned last time that Solomon wrote the book and that it really chronicled his courtship and his wedding and even after his wedding to the Shulamite, his honeymoon and his marriage and then the years following that. We learn that the Song of Songs is first of all a love story written by God, but you don't find God's name in it anywhere. And we learn, too, that it reads like a drama. It's beautiful. It's poetic. We learn that it has two main characters, the young king longing for his beautiful bride and the young bride longing for her husband. We learn that it's a story of tension, sexual tension, sexual restraint, of not awakening love and desire until the right time. And it's a story of a wedding. It's, and it's a wonderful story of a wedding. It's a story of dreams. It's a story that contains fear, fear of losing the one that you love, a story that chronicles the dangers of letting love fade in a good marriage. Yet, as we continue through the song, we'll see that it has a happy ending. And of course, the book is the clearest picture we have anywhere about the emotional and physical intimacy between a man and a woman. We learn that the song gives us a biblical view of human sexuality. And we talked last time how God created marriage for procreation. We're made to have babies. We learned that it was to fulfill a natural God-given desire for intimacy. We learned that it's to become one flesh, not just physically, but spiritually as well. And we look briefly at the flow of the book. Chapter 1, beginning with the girl at the palace, then moving to the countryside. And chapter 1 is where we're going to pitch our tent today. And the drama opens after their dating relationship, if you want to call it that, or their courtship has already begun. And we're going to get a glimpse of what dating slash courting should look like until the wedding which takes place in chapter 3. And there's going to be some bumps in the road during this dating slash courtship relationship. And then later on, as we go into their marriage, we're going to see the bumps in that as well. So as we move through the song, you will see God's ideal. You'll be moved. I hope you'll be moved. You'll be in awe of his standard and what he sets out for us in his word because he is going to reveal it to us in living color. And as we see it, some of us will realize how much we've missed. Some of us will see how we did everything wrong or depending on where you are in your season of life, how right now you are doing everything wrong in this whole area of dating, courting, and marrying. In fact, we could probably say most of us are in that camp. And that's the point, really, because I want to remind you, if we did everything wrong or if we are doing everything wrong, God wants to show us not to beat us up but to give us hope. Because here's the thing about our Lord. He is a God of redemption. He is a God of restoration. And it's only when we realize how wrong we are or how wrong we've been that we can move forward, that we can say, oh, I see it now, and I want to move forward by the grace of God. So whether married or not, this book applies to each one of us. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 to 17 says, all Scripture is inspired by God. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, 
teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So anytime you hear the word of God taught, it applies to you. It doesn't matter if the pastor's teaching in Ephesians 5, which we're going to look at today about marriage. It doesn't matter if he's teaching, if, if, if we're studying passages that deal with, you know, being a, a, a good wife or a good mom or whatever it is. It doesn't matter because all scripture is inspired by God. But that's not all in terms of the song of songs. You know married people. You know people who will get married. You have sisters, daughters, cousins, friends young girls whom you will teach and you have to understand God's word the whole counsel of God's word not just the passages that you like or the passage that you feel comfortable with so the other thing when I say that's not all too is through this study God wants to open your eyes pry them open and keep them open in a deeper sense of how you should relate to him because if you are a believer you are the bride of Christ and at the end of this study, we're going to look, we're going to take the time to look at the book even more from that perspective. So the point being, whatever it is in God's word, never say it doesn't apply to you. That, and not that you're saying that about this, but I just know believers, they'll say, oh, that doesn't apply to me. Oh, yes, it does. So chapter one, I'm going to read the chapter and then we're going to walk through the verses. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. May he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like purified oil. Therefore, the maidens love you. Draw me after you and let us run together. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will rejoice in you and be glad. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. I am black but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am swarthy, for the sun has burned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me caretaker of the vineyards, but I have not taken care of my own vineyard. Tell me, O you whom my soul loves, where do you pasture your flock? Where do you make it lie down at noon? For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks? of your companions. If you yourself do not know most beautiful among women, go forth on the trail of the flock and pasture your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. To me, my darling, you are like my mare among the chariots of Pharaoh. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of beads. We will make for you ornaments of gold with beads of silver. While the king was at his table, my perfume gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a pouch of myrrh which lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. How beautiful you are, my darling, how beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves. How handsome you are, my beloved, and so pleasant. Indeed, our couch is luxuriant. The beams of our house are cedars, our rafters, cypresses. Now keep in mind that this is like reading Solomon's romantic journal. He's chronicling his romance with his woman. And this is what verse 1 reveals when he says, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Kind of like saying, this is my journal. If you, if you keep a journal at the beginning like Audrey Brogy, this is my journal. And then he shows us, number one on your outline, she longs for him. Verses 2 to 7 are her words. And she's not shy about expressing her heart. So let's see what she says. Verse 2 says, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Now, you have to keep in mind that the king has already declared his intentions toward the Shulamite. They are already in this courting phase, this dating phase. And of course, dating today in our culture, defined, as it's defined, usually means that there are no strings attached. It's just a friendship, kind of like getting to know someone, because how will you get to know someone, a little bit of what they're like, if you don't spend some time with them? It's kind of like testing the waters a little bit. And courting is an old-fashioned word. And it carries the meaning of a, man's, a man wooing a woman for the expressed purpose of winning her heart for marriage. And it's risky for him because sometimes guys don't know what to do, especially in the day and age in which we're living. It's risky for him. He's not sure what she's thinking, but he wants to pursue her. He is not recreational dating. He's at the place where he wants a wife. 
So he makes his intentions known. And if the girl is still under her for father's authority, he makes those intentions known to her father. It's because he wants to spend some time wooing her heart to see if this is the one that God has for him. So he declares that this is his intention, and he waits for her response. And here in the song, we see that she is responding to the king, and he's thrilled with this. So much so that this is the first thing he records, her longing for him to kiss her. She wants, she desires, she longs for his kisses. Now, she's not expressing here an inappropriate desire. She's expressing a desire for a, a deep love, a pure love in the Bible often refers to the kiss as an expression of love for other believers, kind of in general. You know, and of course you've heard Carl mention that before, like, I don't want any guys coming up going, you know, the way a lot of cultures do. But Romans 16, 16 says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. 1 Peter 5, verse 14 says, Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to all of you who are in Christ. So, of course, she's not expressing here this brotherly kind of, of uh, kiss. She, but she's not embarrassed or ashamed to express this longing that she has for him because it is a natural longing. It's a normal longing because if you don't want the kisses of the one your heart loves, something's wrong. And then she says, for your love is better than wine. She's expressing that his love is refreshing to her. She continues in verse 3, your oils have a pleasing fragrance. What she's saying here is he smells good. <laughs> He's made himself smell good when he was around her. He showered, if you want to use our terms today, showered. Maybe he used his aftershave, so to speak. The oils here is not referring to his testosterone. It's referring to his taking care of himself. You know, guys do this too, you know, and they should. Before a man or a young man goes on a date or meets his fiance, he showers, he dresses, he makes himself smell good. He, a guy who cares about the girl that he's interested in, he'll do this. He won't show up at her door with greasy hair, with dirty clothes, without showering. Making He tries to make himself as handsome as he can for this girl that he's interested in. But if he does show up with greasy hair, with dirty clothes and all those things, something's usually wrong. Now, that's not the case if, you know, he just didn't have time and he just can't wait to see her, you know? Because it is great to see a young man, or even your husband, those of you who are married, dripping in sweat from working so hard, or coming home at the end of the day and he's beat, but you can tell he's been working, and, then, and you're attracted to him because this man works so hard. Maybe when he's working in the yard trying to keep it nice, maybe when he's hauling branches, or mowing the lawn, or just put, you can just put in there whatever you've seen your husband do where he's working hard and he hasn't had time to shower, he hasn't had time to make himself, himself smell good for you. But a guy in general who's dating, who's courting, and cares about his woman, and a, a husband with he's going with his wife on a date in the evening, he's going to put on a few oils. He's going to have a pleasant fragrance about him. And then she says, your name is like purified oil, therefore the maidens love you. Now here she's speaking of his name, and his name meant something. And, and y'all, we all know that a person's name represents character. It represents a reputation. So when she compares Solomon's name to purified oil, she's talking about his character. And his character was not only great in her eyes, but in other people's eyes. That's what she's saying here when she says, all the maidens love you. Because a lot of women took notice of him. Many were attracted to him because of his character, who he was, not just because he was handsome. I mean, obviously, all of us, if we have eyes to see, if we notice a handsome guy who's handsome in our eyes, of course, we take notice of him. But then we might be totally running the other direction if he has a terrible character. But that's what's saying here. Now, think about this for a moment, and it doesn't matter if you're, especially if you're single, but think about it. Think back if you're married. 
you know, go back in your mind. So I can say when your husband or any guys that may have shown an interest in you in the past, and those of you who are not married today, if a guy shows interest in you, do you think about his reputation? Do you check out his reputation? Do you think about his character? Do you ask yourself some questions? Was he married before? Has he been divorced? And if he has, why? Or if he, is he the type of guy that's had a slew of girlfriends? And if he has, what do they say about him? Or what have they said about him? Or what have you heard about him? And I'm not talking about just rumors. I'm just talking about, you know, is there a track record? And what does it mean? What do those who know him best say about him? Is he known? And if he is, what is he known for? You know, there's nothing wrong with being concerned about someone's past. Nothing wrong with it. Because you ought to know those things. You ought to look into those things, especially as it concerns other relationships he's had. What's his track record? Is he known as a liar, a cheater? Is he known as being a lazy guy who has nothing going on for him, no direction in life? Or he doesn't, can't hold a job or he doesn't want a job and he doesn't want to work or pay his own way? Is he a mama's boy? And I'm not talking here about a man who has a healthy relationship with his mother. He should. And all of you single women, you should want the guy you're dating or that you're interested in to have a healthy respect and love for his mother. Because here's the thing. The way he treats her and talks about her and respects her or lack of respect will end up being the way he treats you and the respect he shows for you. So you should pray for that. And it might be that his mother is not worthy of much respect. It might be that she's an unbeliever or whatever it is, but still, does he still look for ways to respect her and honor her and treat her in a way that even if for some reason she doesn't really deserve it? You've got to think about those kinds of things. But here I'm talking about a mama's boy in the sense that he's very dependent upon his parents. As a grown man, the type of man who cannot cut the apron strings, as we say today. Or maybe he's immature socially. Or maybe he's the type of guy who can't make his own decisions. I mean, that kind of trait is negative in a grown man. Again, does he have clear direction? Not that he has it all mapped out if he's 17 or if he's 22, but he has a direction he's headed in. He's got plans. Is he a strong believer? You know, I used to tell my daughter, and I've told young women, and I still tell women this all the time, you don't want to just marry a believer. A believer, that fact of being a believer, that is a given. That's like undisputed. Of course, that's what the scripture teaches. You're not to be unequally yoked. Of course you should marry a believer. It's a given. But you also want to marry a believer whose heart beats for God, who puts the Lord above his earthly relationships. And of course, to, for that kind of man to be attracted to you, you have to be that kind of woman, a woman whose heart beats for God. You don't want some nominal Christian, and neither does a godly man. He doesn't want a nominal Christian, and you don't want a weak, passive man, but you want one whom you can follow because God will call you to follow that man, not somebody you have to beat off the couch to get to work or someone who's selfish, or someone who's dependent upon you to pay his way, or someone who's looking for you to be the provider, the protector, the defender of the home. No, you don't want someone you, whom you have to lead around. And of course, we've probably all dated some losers, some mama's boys in the negative sense of the word, some cheaters, some slackers. I know I did. You know, one very bad experience I had was when I was um, with, uh, dating a young man when I was in college. And you know, I thought he was so handsome and so did a bunch of other girls. And he was really a charmer. He had this gorgeous smile. He knew all the right compliments. He knew the right lines. I think I was just too naive to understand that he was a player. And so he began to talk to me and eventually he asked me out and friends of mine who knew him 
And his reputation would say to me, you're going to date him? Audrey, he goes from one girl to the next. He tries to get what he wants. He's a player. He plays a game, and when you don't deliver, he drops you. And if you do deliver, he still drops you. I didn't believe them because he was so sweet. They couldn't be talking about the same guy. This guy seemed so genuine. He went to church with me. Now, I would hear about his reputation. I just didn't want to believe it because he convinced me he was different. I asked him if he was a Christian. Sure he was. He was whatever I wanted him to be. And I had a great time with him. He was a lot of fun. But I want to tell you something. Even though there was nothing inappropriate going on in the relationship with, between us, because we were just hanging out, people began to assume it was because of his reputation. And of course, I dropped him like a hot potato. <laughs> Proverbs 22, verse 1 a good name is to be more desired than great wealth. A good name is to be more desired than great wealth. And so after a while, I realized my friends were right. I realized that, and I dropped him. And he was exactly what I had heard. I just had not wanted to believe it. And I'm just so glad God protected me from disaster. And what a contrast Carl was. When he began to pursue me, I already knew him by reputation. I just knew him by reputation. I remember the first time I saw him. He was sharing his testimony at College Life, which was an evangelistic outreach on our campus. And I had heard that he was the new staff guy on campus who had raised his support very quickly. I had also heard that he shared the gospel all the time. And students were praying to receive, receive Christ with him all the time. This is what I was hearing. And so for a whole year, while I was dating someone else, not the charmer, that was just a short thing, <laughs> but a good guy, I heard Carl Brogy teach the Bible. I heard what people said about Carl Brogy. I met students whom Carl Brogy led to Christ. His character was known. You know, while we're here, while we're talking about a good name, I want to be very practical. Let me give you some other things to look for in a man and things to pray for if you're already married and you're a man. Things to teach your daughters because along with a good name, there are also givens, I believe, in Scripture about the character of someone to consider marrying. Must be a believer, 2 Corinthians 6. Not just a believer, but a sold-out believer, and you'll see that all throughout the Scripture. <laughs> Not a player. Works hard. You see that in, it just in Genesis. Able to provide and support and defend and protect has direction in life, may not have it all mapped out, but is moving toward a goal. Has his own convictions from God's word, not just following yours. Not a wandering eye or a ladies' man. Not selfish or self-centered or just full of himself. Because if you marry a man who only thinks about himself, you will be miserable the rest of your life. The Shulamite continues in verse 4. Draw me after you and let us run together. The king has brought me into his chamber. She's expressing here something that she's looking forward to. This is a request. She's looking forward to when they will be together. And that's why she says, we will rejoice in you and be glad. We will extol your love more than wine. She's talking about their future together. And it sounds like you and me, doesn't she? Doesn't she sound that way? If you're single, don't you dream about one day being married or who God will bring to be your husband? If you are married, didn't you think about running together with your husband? Didn't you think about the day when he would bring you into his chambers? We might say it differently, like I can't wait until we're together forever where we don't have to say goodbye. We won't have to say goodnight at the end of the date. We'll have our own place. We'll be together. And then speaking about the maidens, the other girls, she says, rightly, do they love you? She's proud of her man. She's going to marry a man with a great name, a great reputation, a good guy, one, of the, the one that is desirable for more than just his nice smile. And let me ask you, again, if you're dating someone, do others love the man you're dating? And I don't mean romantically love him. That's not what what she's talking about. That's not what we're, I'm talking about. But do they think well of him? Because romance and, and longing, romance and longing for someone is right and good when it's directed toward the one you will spend the rest of your life with. 
and the relationship is held in great restraint until marriage. Now, I want to summarize this section for just a moment because we see how the girl longs for her boyfriend, if you want to call him that. It is a desire for romance, and it's clear that there is absolutely nothing wrong with this desire if it is brought before the Lord because God made us this way. And remember, that's what he created in the Garden of Eden. It's a good thing. God himself is the one who gave these desires to us. They just are supposed to be properly guided, properly guarded, properly given to the right man. We are supposed to desire the one that we marry. It's a desire that God wants to cultivate and deepen as the, as the years go by. And it's so sad among Christian marriages that young couples do not see older women who still long for their husbands, who still love their husbands with their whole heart and refer to him as their best friend. And he's the, he's the one that means more to them than anybody else in the, on the earth. And that she's so glad she married him. And she's so glad that she didn't say yes to some other losers. But she's so thankful that he's her husband and that God gave him to her and that he's their daddy. We need to be those kinds of women, y'all. The older role models so much that we see in our day are older women who roll their eyes or who complain with their lips or who make fun of. Or they're, That's so much of what we see. Ladies, we sometimes reap what we sow in this area of our, our lives. You know, we want our husbands to do all the work. We want our husbands to talk about us in that way. But we don't want to talk about him in that way. We want him to tell our children how fortunate they are that, or that he is that he married us and how fortunate they are to have us as a mom. But we sometimes don't want to do the same thing for him to build him up, to respect him. And I know there are a lot of women who think, well, my husband, you know, has so many faults. Of course he does. And so do you. But why can't we look for the good? Why can't we build up the good? You know what Philippians says, if there's anything excellent, anything worthy of praise, think on these things. You know, look at that list in Philippians. Can you take anything in that list and say, you know, this is worthy of praise in my husband's life. This is excellent in my husband's life. This is of good repute in my husband's life, and I'm going to tell him, and I'm going to hold that up. Does he have faults? Of course he does. And again, so do you. So do I. Like the Shulamite, when we were first in love with our husbands, for those of us who are married, we wanted him to kiss us with the kisses of his mouth. But how about after a few years of marriage? Of course, we'll be dealing with this aspect in greater detail later because the Shulamite had the same problem after some time in her marriage. I mean, God is so good to tell us the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's hard when we get to some of these later chapters to believe it's the same woman. But God gives us this realistic picture. He has so much to tell us. So she longed for him, but, this, but it, the scripture continues, number two on your outline, is she feels ugly. And she tells the city girls, I am, a, I am black but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am swarthy, for the sun has burned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me caretaker of the vineyards, but I have not taken care of my own vineyard. Now, this girl was, wasn't tan, <laughs> and the sun hadn't burned her because she was sitting by the beach all day or the poolside all day, or because she was visiting tanning beds. I don't even know if that's a thing anymore. But her tan and her dark skin came from, the darker, as it got darker, came from hard work in the sun. You know, back in the, when my grandmother was a young woman, it was only the poor country girls who were tan. You know, like the Shulamite, they were tan because they worked in the fields. And they were wearing that big hats and they were covering themselves with clothing to protect their skin from being darkened and burned. And it was only the rich women, the rich young women who were fair. And being fair 
was a sign of a pampered life. The poor country girls wore hats, like I said, in the long sleeves to protect themselves. My grandmother would never, ever, ever, ever have tried to get a tan. I can't even picture that. So when the Shulamite compared herself to the pampered city girls, she felt swarthy. And that means she felt insecure. That's why she added, don't stare at me, don't look at me. I mean, you ever like feel kind of like ugly or unattractive? You say, don't look at me. You know, don't look at me right now. I look awful. Don't take my picture, I look terrible. We all feel that way. And she's comparing her dark skin to the tents of Kedar, which were made of black goat's hair. The people there were nomads in northern Arabia who descended from Ishmael. Apparently, the tent curtains of Solomon were also black. She was almost apologetic about her appearance. She explains, I have to work in the fields. I have no time to take care of myself. But like Boaz who noticed the poor country girl gleaning in the field, the king had taken notice of this poor country girl. You remember Boaz? He was attracted to Ruth for this very reason. And like Ruth, this girl knew how to work. A good man, a good man, a man of good reputation, a man who values what ought to be valued in a woman, takes notice of a girl who is responsible. Not the girl who's lazy. You know, I talked earlier about we don't want a lazy man. Well, a good man doesn't want a lazy woman. Neither of us are supposed to be lazy. You know, sometimes Carl and I have this joke. <laughs> and he, he's been working hard all day, and he'll, he'll call me on his way home, and he'll say, so, so what's your day been like? I said, well, I've just been like eating bonbons and sitting on the sofa and watching TV. I've gotten so much done watching TV. I mean, it's, I, always, I do that almost every time he asks me that. <laughs> But the Shulamite didn't sit in, front, sit in front of the fashion magazines or the social media influencers all the time. She wasn't always scrolling on her phone. She wasn't making TikTok videos of herself. She wasn't constantly taking selfies and posting them, especially inappropriately, with the way so many of our young Christian girls do today. Young Christian girls and even older Christian women. I should say this because I know plenty of 60-something-year-old women who post inappropriate photos and videos of themselves. She, you know, this, this isn't what she spent her time doing, and this is not what Ruth spent her time doing. And neither was she taking off and leaving her family to do all the work to keep the home going. She's pulling her weight at home. But suddenly here... She is face-to-face -face with these city girls, and in comparison, she feels ugly. And, of course, she's not married now. When I say taking off and leaving the home, she's working in her own home. And what we see in the Scripture, we'll see even more later on in this book. But she's face-to-face -face with the city girls, and in comparison, she feels ugly. Look, young women, when you, if you're on social media all the time, are you, it, it's, it's a cesspool for comparing yourself with other people, and it can certainly make you feel insecure. You don't even think about that. Well, there's Photoshop and everything. They're putting filters on everything. They're doing all this stuff because they want to be seen in the best light possible. And so she becomes insecure. And that's what it does for a lot of us when we spend all of our time doing that stuff, not doing what God's called us to do, but all we're doing is comparing ourselves to all the people out there. And she mentions here her brothers. She says, my mother's sons were angry with me. They made me caretaker of the vineyards, but I have not taken care of my own vineyard. So we see she's from a large family. And here she's almost blaming her brothers for what she perceives as her ugliness. She's not grateful in this part here for the way her family raised her. She doesn't see it now. She will. But it is the very way she was raised that caused the king to want her. I mean, think about all the things, <laughs> you know, if you have some years on you, if you've already left home, that you were so ungrateful for, and you blamed your parents for, and they were so mean, and they made you do this, this, and this, and this, and then you give it 20 years, or maybe even 10 years. You give it a few years, like, whoa, I'm so grateful for that. Wow, am I grateful for that. You see it from a different perspective. And these brothers were actually protecting her, 
And, and again, again, like I said, we're going to see it later. It's a beautiful picture of them protecting her. We just get a little glimpse of it here because we only see it from her perspective here while she's young. But they were keeping her away from the wrong boys. And listen, working, having responsibility at home while you're growing up keeps a lot of young women out of trouble. I mean, because it is true, so many young women, and young boys too, but we're talking about us, have too much free time, and parents sometimes are afraid to manage their children's time. They're not helping their daughters learn how to cook, how to mop a floor, how to clean a bathroom. But wow, do, can we put, do we know how to do the makeup tutorials? And nothing wrong with that. I'm not, like, I'm not like saying those things are bad. I'm just talking about the emphasis here. I'm talking about a way of life here. Being consumed with this. The constant mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Please say it's me. And if it's not me, I'm going to do everything I can to make it me. And some of us as moms, we don't feel like fighting our daughters on these things to do the responsible thing. And the sad thing is if we have enough money... We don't even do these things ourselves. We either neglect it or we hire it out. And again, nothing wrong with hiring out. I'm not saying that. I'm just talking about abdication of responsibility. Because while there's nothing wrong with hiring people to help you with things, whatever it is, I don't care, you can just fill in the blank. It's quite another to hire people and not expect your children or even yourself to do some of those things. Because you don't want your children to grow up with the mentality of, yeah, the help will get that. The help will do that. You have, to you have to have personal responsibility yourself, and you have to teach that with your children. So work keeps us busy. It keeps us fit. It keeps us out of trouble. And it used to be a time when children were a needed part of the family. Now it's just like too much work. And after expressing speaking to the city girl, she asked the king a question. So that's at point three. She questions him. Tell me, O oh you whom my soul loves, where do you pasture your flock? Where do, you make, where do you make it lie down at noon? Her insecurity made her want to make sure of her standing with him. She was clinging to him, not in an unhealthy way. She's in love with him. And she needs to feel secure in his love. You know, that she, 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 that's what she wants here. And, of course, it's the intended, the clinginess here, if you want to use that term. It's not in the negative sense, but it's kind of like the meaning that we see in Genesis chapter 2 of the two shall become one flesh, like stick together like glue, that if you rip them apart, part of them, you know, there's pieces left. And that's what we're seeing here. Because, but when you're courting, when you're in that relationship before you get married, you're not going to always be together, but you'll want to be together. You'll be on each other's mind. She wanted to be with him. That's the one thing she desires above all else. She describes him in simple, beautiful terms. Oh, you whom my soul loves. He is her soulmate. So if you're single, do you already feel this way about someone now? If you're married, do you feel this way about your husband? And if not, why not? And if not... Ask God to create that within you. Can you say of your husband, oh, you are the one my soul loves. And that is what God wants for a husband and wife. Ephesians 5, to 33. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their 
their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great. But I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So the Shulamite says, O oh, you whom my soul loves. Ladies, if you're married, go home at some point today and say that to your husband. And tell the Lord. Is the Lord the one whom your soul loves? Do you love him above all else? Has he captured your heart and your soul the Shulamite continues, where do you pastor your flock? Where do you make it lie down at noon? So she's addressing him as a shepherd. He is a shepherd king. He owned many flocks. She wants to know where he, he will be. She wants to meet him. But notice she wants to meet him at noon, in the middle of the day, not at night. And then she states why. For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? A veiled woman... In those days, what she's referring to was a loose woman, maybe even a prostitute. The Shulamite doesn't want to be mistaken for that kind of girl. She wants to protect her own reputation. She doesn't want to give people reason to gossip or to think she's doing anything improper. So she asks for a particular place and a time for them to meet. In the broad daylight, out in the open. She wanted him, yes, but she wanted him appropriately. She wanted parameters around their relationship. That brings us to point four. So he assures her, If you yourself do not know most beautiful among women, go forth on the trail of the flock and pasture your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. So he tells her where to find him. If she follows the trail of his sheep, she will find him. In, in the middle of this verse, though, he calls her most beautiful among women. He knows she needs to hear this. Don't you love that? Oh, I'm going to answer your question, oh, beautiful among women. Do you ever get tired of real compliments? I mean, real compliments. I'm not talking about flattery. But do you ever get tired of your husband telling you you're beautiful? You know, think about it, ladies. You know, if he tells you you're beautiful one day and then he doesn't tell you for a long time, what might you assume? Or if you say, well, how do I look? And he says, fine. Who wants to hear that? I don't want to look fine. Well, that means you don't think I, I look nice. No, I said you look fine. I don't want to be fine to you. Tell me how I look to you. This, what woman doesn't want to be told she's beautiful all the time? This is why, y'all, pickup lines work. This is why the charmer guys know what to say. But the king here, Solomon, means it. He knows of her insecurity, and he wants to be her source of security. You know, if you will be a godly woman... And wait for the man, I'm talking about those of you who are not married, and wait for the man that God has for you. You will be the most beautiful among women to him. You won't have to worry about other women. Not in the general sense. I mean, anybody can fall into sin. We understand that. But why? Because he's not going to measure you according to their beauty. He, was, he didn't pursue them. He didn't go after them. He went after you. He'll measure them by your beauty. You'll be the standard. You will be the most beautiful among women. No one will measure up to you. And that's why it's so important, again, not to fall for a charmer. That's why it's so important to wait for the guy whose heart beats for the Lord. Because y'all, 
there will always be women out there who looks better than you do or at least that's what you'll think and the longer you live and the older you get there will always be women by the world standards who are going to look better than you that's why a real relationship a husband and wife relationship is not based on that of course you notice those things we're seeing it all throughout chapter one but if it's the one that your soul loves you love their soul you love their character you love who they are and because that's what the person has spent all this time cultivating whether it's you or whether it's the man then it comes out in their expressions it just comes out and you just think they're the most handsome among men because of their character because of who they are because of what their heart beats for that's what keeps you Verse 9, he says, To me, my darling, you are like my mare among the chariots of Pharaoh. I don't know why I laugh at that every time. Because this is the first of many times he's going to call her, number one, his darling. But then he likens her to his horse. <laughs> How would you like to be told you look like a horse? <laughs> but the Shulamite, Shulamite didn't mind, though, because Solomon had plenty of horses, and she knows how important his horses were to him. And the mayor, the mayor represented grace, stature, noble character, and beauty. She understood that. The mayor stood out above and beyond the other horses. The mayor was unique and special. And then he says, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of beads. Now remember, she had been concerned about being swarthy, I like that word, swarthy. She was concerned about that, she, about her appearance, her swarthy appearance, self-conscious, fully aware that she had nothing compared to the great beauties in the city, the fair maidens. She was that poor country girl. She was not only darkened by the sun, but she didn't have any jewelry. But to him, she didn't even need them because she's lovely without them. He says, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments. Your neck, like a string of beads. He's saying, you're more beautiful than, than the jewelry you're going to put on. She's lovely without them is what he's saying. Yet most girls love to be adorned, and he says he's the one who's going to adorn her. Verse 11, we will make for you ornaments of gold with beads of silver. And hearing this, at his words, her self-consciousness begins to melt away. And he speaks again, and this time, point five on your outline, she feels confident. Verse 12. While the king was at his table, my perfume gave forth its fragrance. My beloved to, is to me a pouch of myrrh, which lies all night between my breasts. You see what the assurance did for, his assurance did for her? Her attention is turned away from herself to him. And do you see the progression here in verse 2 to 4? She's enraptured by him and only talks about him. In verses 5 to 7, she focuses on herself as she compares herself to other women and blames her family for how ugly she thinks she is. They're the reason I don't get to take care of myself. In verses 8 to 11, instead of scolding her for this, the king assures her of her beauty and how beautiful she is to him. And now she is so confident in his love, her focus moves from herself to the one she loves. So she praises him. She likes the way he is. He's like the perfume she wears in, uh, in the pouch around her neck. That's what she means when she says, my beloved is to me a pouch of myrrh which lies all night between my breasts. You know, when you think about it, when you put a little perfume on in, uh, on in the morning, you have that fragrance all day. And I love, you know, when you see the imagery and the metaphors in the New Testament about how that's what we're supposed to be to a lost and dying world, a fragrant aroma. And, of course, to those who are rejecting Christ, we're a stench. But to those who are being saved, we're like this pleasing, pleasant aroma. And that's what she's saying, that he is a pleasing fragrance because that's what myrrh was. It was a pleasing fragrance. And it's a, it, it was like a, a wonderful perfume, and so he's constantly in her thoughts, just like that pleasing perfume. It's like, where's that coming from? Verse 14, my beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. Henna blossoms were beautiful white flowers. Engedi was an oasis on the coast of the Dead Sea. All other, all other men, she is saying, compared with him, were like the desert. There's nobody like him. No other man even begins to compare to him. 
Does your husband know that no other man compares to him in your eyes? Again, sometimes I tell my husband, I'm so glad I didn't marry so-and-so. I'm so glad God busted that up. I'm so glad I didn't fall for the charmer. I'm so glad God busted that up. And when the one finds you, he will be like a breath of fresh air. No other man will compare to him. You might think your heart was broken over so-and-so, and you shed many tears over a broken relationship maybe because you just thought you were so in love and he was the love of your life and blah, 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 blah. God busts it up. No, he's not the love of your life. I want to bring you the love of your life. And that brings us to point six, love talk, or you could say love talks. The king says in verse 15, how beautiful you are, my darling, how beautiful you are. The king cannot help repeating how beautiful she is. You think she's tired of hearing it? Not on your life. It's just the beginning, y'all. And if you don't like this kind of love talk, you better not come back next time. Your eyes are like doves, he says. Now, of course, they're gazing into each other's eyes. Eyes are a window to the soul. And comparing her eyes to doves reveals that she was pure of heart. She didn't have the eyes of an adulterous woman. He knows that. Her turn, verse 16. How handsome you are, my beloved. She's expressing the same thing to him. A man likes to be told he's handsome. I mean, we, are, we think we're the only ones who want to be complimented in that way. No, he likes for you to take notice of him. Wow, you look great. Wow, that really looks good on you. Wow, you know, let me cut your hair because you'll look so much better when I do. Or whatever. <laughs> but she's attracted to him because women do care about how her man looks. But I want to ask you something, and he should care too. But do you want your husband or the guy you're interested in looking in the mirror more than you do? I mean, do you? You know, <laughs> I'll never forget, what, you know, when we were watching with our Avonlea with our kids when they were growing up, and there's a scene in one of them where I don't remember the people's name. I don't remember any of that, but basically it's like this. You know, boyfriend, all you ever do is talk about yourself. Can't you ever talk about anything else? Why don't you ever ask about me? And he says to her, sure, I can talk about something else. I can ask about you. So tell me, what do you think about me? <laughs> so sure, she was attracted to him, but she also adds, and so pleasant. He's so pleasant. Not only he, is he a good-looking man, and she thinks he's really handsome, but again, he's pleasant. He's fun to be around, and he's good to her. How many men have you known that look great on the outside, but they're big jerks? But this man is both handsome and pleasant. And isn't that what we all want? But I want to tell you something else. Those two qualities in one man were rare then, and they're rare today. Handsome, good name, good reputation, and pleasant? A man of character? Remember what she said earlier? Your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like purified oil. Therefore, the maidens love you. And here for the first time, she calls him my beloved. She'll use that name over and over and over. Verse 16, how handsome you are, my beloved or beloved, however you want to say it, and so pleasant. Then she says, indeed, our couch is luxuriant. Verse 17, the beams of our houses are cedars, our rafters, cypresses. She's referring to the countryside where they first met. She has pleasant memories. For those of you who are married, where were you when you first fell in love with your husband? I mean, when you first realized it was more than just, I don't know, nothing. <laughs> where were you? Do you remember that place with where you could say it was luxuriant. <laughs> I mean, is that the way you remember? It's like, whoa. I remember when suddenly I thought, this is, this is something more. I see him in a different light right now. You don't forget that. I don't forget it. He's more than just a Bible teacher. He's more than just someone I know by reputation. 
And that's what she says. It's luxuriant. So they're courting. They're expressing their love for one another. He's making her feel secure because that's what all women want. They want to feel secure because maybe men that you dated in the past or maybe that you date now, you don't feel secure because you don't know. But that's what a husband's supposed to do for his wife. She should feel secure in that love. And then a wife is supposed to encourage her husband. She's supposed to respect him. We just saw that when I read to you from Ephesians 5. Let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. You do that, women. You do that. Your husband will, will slay dragons for you. It's, he's wired that way. She works hard. She respects him. He works hard. He loves her. He tells her she's beautiful. She tells him that no one compares to him. And that's the way it should be during this phase that they're in right now if they're moving towards marriage. But that's the way it should be 25 years later. Well, let me back up. That's the way it should be seven years later because everyone says there's a seven-year itch. That's the way it should be 10 years later. That's the way it should be 15, 20, 25, 50 years into marriage. In fact, not only should it be that way, but it should be growing in depth because you know that person even greater. You know them from the inside out. If you are walking with the Lord and developing in your own relationship with the Lord and loving him with all your heart, soul, and mind, and the man that you're married to is doing the same thing, it's only going to get better and deeper. That's the way it should be. That's what God wants for us. And if yours isn't like that, begin today to pray and ask him to make it that way. Let it begin with you. Search me, O God, and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Instead of always saying, well, if he would just change. Well, if he would do this, if he would do that, if he would say this, if he would say that, maybe change that to like, if I would say this, if I would do this, if I would if I would just obey God and see what God would do, see what God does as you obey the Lord. Father, I thank you for our time in the, your word today. I thank you for all of the truths that we've seen and walked through in chapter 1. And this is only the beginning. This is where we see their young love and what they express to one another and how they feel about each other. And we also know the broader picture is the picture of Christ and his bride. Father, I pray you would help us understand the practicality of this book and in terms of the relationships that we should have here in our earthly lives, but, you, but you, that you would also continue to show us the broader picture here, that we are image bearers, that we represent you on this earth if we belong to you. Father, I thank you that you didn't leave us <laughs> in our sin, in our swarthiness, in our ugliness. I thank you that you called us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your marvelous light, and you are the one who clothes us. You transform us from the inside out because of your son's death on the cross, that we stand ugly, pitiful, swarthy, filthy rags on our own but you with your heart of redemption and heart of restoration sent your son to die in our place you paid the sin debt that we owe and because we have placed our faith and trust in you and your death on the cross you are the one who calls us your beloved beloved and we are beautiful in your sight because of what you've done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, welcome, you guys. We're so glad to be here.